there's something special about the great sci-fi films when it comes to exploring our humanity. They often use imaginative and alien concepts which ultimately serve as a contrast to reveal something intimate about ourselves, some deeper insight into our existence. I think Arrival is one of those great films and today I want to explore why, beginning with a brief analysis of its main character, Louise. After 12 ships carrying aliens known as heptapods arrive on Earth, linguistics professor Louise gets tasked with communicating with them to learn about their purpose. Through a number of scenes with Louise and her child which appear to be her memories, it seems as if we're given a backstory on her character. However, towards the end of the film we learn that these scenes from Louise's her past are actually scenes from her future, which subverts our initial assumption that Louise was a grieving mother throughout the events of the film. This begs the question, if Louise wasn't the person we thought her to be, then who was she? If we look at the beginning of the film without any assumptions about Louise's her past, I believe there are a number of signs that suggest that she is someone who isn't fully embracing life, who is shying away from it. For starters, Louise seems highly attached to her comfort zone, secluded from the rest of the world which she witnesses mostly through windows and television screens as she goes about her daily routine. She doesn't seem all that excited about her job and generally comes across as living a very quiet uneventful life. It is because of this that she is also reluctant towards change, which becomes especially clear when change is forced on her as the heptapods arrive on Earth. While the rest of the world is reacting to this monumental event, Louise appears to be the only one who isn't fully processing it as she shows up at her class to find it empty. This slow reaction to change is also shown in the phone call with her mother, suggesting that she's been who she is for quite some time. We can even see it later when Louise is unexpectedly picked up in the middle of the night and she asks for 20 minutes to get ready but only receives 10. It's a small detail but still another sign pointing towards Louise's her slow reaction to sudden change and her overall hesitance to face life. But what can we tell about where this hesitance could come from? If we don't have a specific backstory for Louise, we can perhaps turn to a more universal one. In The Denial of Death, Ernest Becker writes about the two great fears that are present in everyone and characterize us as human beings. These are the fear of death and the fear of life. Both, I think, are rooted in our perception and experience of time. In my video on Interstellar, I explained how we are free to move around within spatial dimensions but are bound by the arrow of time, forced to experience this dimension moment by moment, from what we see as the past towards what we see as the future. Arrival 2 recognizes this temporal imprisonment as Louise notes, we are so bound by time, by its order. And yet we can perceive the arrow of time, witness our lives moving forward without being able to alter this movement. Ernest Becker points out the paradox that arises from our time transcending perception, our almost godlike ability to oversee the whole concept of time, while at the same time being bound to a physical body that dooms us to inescapably experience all of it in a predetermined order. Perhaps the most important consequence of this paradox is that we can perceive our own mortality we know that someday we are going to die and this naturally fills us with fear. We are falling asleep at the wheel people, you know what I'm talking about, I know you do. Interestingly, out of this fear for our eventual annihilation also follows a fear of life, as Ernest Becker explains. The irony of man's condition is that the deepest need is to be free of the anxiety of death and annihilation, but it is life itself which awakens it, and so we must shrink from being fully alive. To put it simply, life in its fullest is too much to handle for limited beings such as ourselves. The incomprehensible vastness of the universe and the fundamental elusiveness of its purpose, the total mystery of our existence in all its beauty and terror, it's just too much. It's like you're staring into the sun. And so we shrink down from life, make it mundane and acceptable. Because in our minds, if we don't engage life, we don't have to engage death. 
Part of this process is natural and even necessary to make it through everyday life without constantly being overwhelmed by our existence and worrying about its ultimate meaning. But when we shrink down too much and hide away in a protective bubble like Louise, we can end up missing life altogether. Which is a shame because death will still come for us. Showing again how the relentless arrow of time is not hindered by our fear of it. I believe that we can view the coming of the heptapods as an arrival of existence itself, with the heptapods being a metaphor for exactly that part of life that we are fearful of. Aside from them being the literal light at the end of the tunnel, they appear to have a complete perception of time and a sense of purpose and meaning far beyond our comprehension. The attempt to communicate with the heptapods can therefore be seen as an attempt to communicate with a manifestation of existence, but for that we need to understand its language. Language is not just about communicating with each other, it is also a tool to develop meaning in the world around us. Language allows us to categorize, to normalize, it allows us to look at billions of uniquely organized atoms and see something ordinary like a car or a classroom. It also allows us to construct a sense of self, a sense of comfort in our own being. It lets us believe that we are in fact someone in particular. It distinguishes me from you. Language stabilizes the chaos of existence, but only to a certain extent, because for all the possibilities it offers, it is also limiting. It doesn't allow us to articulate the entirety of existence and therefore fails to alleviate our fear of it. This failure of language to mitigate our fear of existence is a major theme in Arrival. We see it in the communication between the different nations and in the rising panic of its citizens, but it is mainly explored through the interactions with the heptapods pots as Louise and her team attempt to understand the alien language to ask the vital question that may as well be directed to all of existence. What is your purpose? When Louise first enters the alien ship, she is extremely hesitant to go up and face the heptapods, and when she does, she does so in protective gear and interacts with the heptapods from behind a protective screen. All of which are signs of our default state of fearfulness. <coughs> Am I fired? You're better than the last guy. That doesn't make me feel any better. After the first encounters, Louise, however, realizes that she won't be able to communicate if she lets herself be dominated by fear and, as her understanding of their language grows, she starts to slowly break down the barriers between her and the heptapods, showing how she, quite literally, is coming out of her shell. Her growing comfort around the heptapods also seems to result in a growing comfort around her colleague Ian. But the personal effects from learning the heptapod language are of course most obvious in the visions from her future, which are coming to her as memories. I don't understand. Who is this child? This is where we arrive at the most tricky and perhaps also the most misunderstood part of the film. The gift of seeing the future that is given to Louise by the heptapods. There is an obvious paradox between being able to see the future and having free will in the present. Because if there's a future event that I know about in the present, this means there must be some coercive force pushing me towards that specific event, rendering my free will useless. But if I know about a future event and I exercise my free will to avoid it, then I wasn't really able to see the future in the first place. I think this paradox goes back to the earlier mentioned paradox of our dual nature 
future, knowing that the complete course of time already exists while being stuck in a consciousness that is forced to move along with the arrow of time, only able to look backwards but never forwards. And yet I believe that in this paradox we can find the true meaning of the heptapod's gift, but only if we don't look at it in the literal sense, because that will only lead to logical impossibilities. Instead I think the more important question is, what does it really mean for Louise to know her future? Aside from using her new awareness to solve the international crisis, on a more personal level it seems as if she no longer lets fear dominate the course of her existence. She no longer hides away from life because she already knows exactly what will come and embraces it, both the good things and the bad. I know something that's going to happen. What? What's going to happen? It has to do with a, a really rare disease. And it's unstoppable. Kind of like you are. You're swimming. And your poetry and all the other amazing things that you share with the world. Her new language allowed her to construct meaning and articulate existence in such a way that it alleviated her fear of it. And that, I think, is the true meaning behind the heptapod's gift. In fact, when you think about how Louise's her life would have played out if the heptapods had never arrived, stuck in her routine, forever hugging her body pillow. The heptapods gift can even be seen as the gift of life itself, as the moment that made Louise choose existence over non-existence. So what does all this mean for the audience? What message does Arrival have for us if we, unlike Louise, cannot see the whole of our existence and can therefore never be truly freed from our fear of it? In the short story, the question is raised that if the heptapods already know everything that's going to happen, why do they need language at all? Or in Louise's her case, if she already knows her future, why would she still choose to live it? To address this issue, Ted Chiang refers to the speech act theory which points out that language is also a performative act. According to speech act theory, statements like you're under arrest, I christened this vessel or I promise were all performative. A speaker could perform the action only by uttering the words. For such acts, knowing what would be said didn't change anything. Everyone at the wedding anticipated the words, I now pronounce you husband and wife. But until the minister actually said them, the ceremony didn't count. With performative languages, saying equaled doing. This could very well be applied to Louise's her new perception of existence. She knows what is going to happen, but it is only when she performs the actions that it becomes real, which, again, she is able to do because she is no longer afraid. I would argue that this also applies to us as we too, in a way, already know our future. We may not know the specific events that will happen to us like Louise does, but we do know with absolute certainty that someday we are going to die and that we will never exist again. We know that along the way there will be sorrow and pain. There will be moments when life seems overwhelming and impossible to endure, when we will suffer deeply. But there can also be beauty and love in tiny and monumental moments when life feels perfect and profound. The point is that if we let ourselves be consumed by our fear of all this, we will never experience any of it, and we will hide away from life until we're left with nothing but regret. When Louise asks Ian what he would do if he was able to change the past, he answered, Maybe I'd say what I feel more often. I think most of us wish that they would have done things differently in the past, but only a few really let those regrets guide their choices in the present. For most of us, our fear of existence is persistent and continues to hold us back from fully embracing life, from treasuring every moment. So if a rival taught me anything, it is to look at life and ask myself, what would I do if I wasn't afraid?